Um, hello, so I I'm Olivier, I I'm not sure, as you might have noticed. Uh, and I will be talking about testing on device with Lava as a part of continuous integration. So, what is continuous integration? At the basic idea is just to merge things early in the code base, right? Merge early, merge often. That's all what continuous integration is. Okay, that's done. Actually, that's not what people think. When they think of continuous integration, they think of an infrastructure to do continuous testing, to test at every commit instead of, you know, twice a year. Um, it's really is an add-on to continuous integration that makes it m much more valuable. Um, it's very popular in the web world, so all the web people use it. Uh, it's really well integrated in things like GitHub, GitLab. You can do something like Travis CI, pop up a Docker container and run your web application and try it and have the, all kinds of automated tests. And this is really cool, except if you're working on the kernel, uh, not very useful. Then, especially if you're working on a little ARM board, you might actually need to boot the, the board itself. So, why do it for Linux? Because we know in Linux there's a lot of code reviews. So, you know, people write some code, you guys review it, and they're like, oh, it's perfect code now. We don't do, need to do any testing. Except we don't, that's not really true, right? If it's not tested, it doesn't work. Um, code review can catch all bugs, we know that, and the sooner you test, the sooner you find the problems. So most of the testing on Linux these days is, is done by humans. And if you're working on x86 based system, that works quite well because we have a lot of humans and they're very cheap. They'll you just put it out there and they'll do all this automated testing on almost a, a daily basis. It's really, really easy. Um, except that if you work on an ARM system, on embedded boards, maybe on an, an, embed, on, on an embedded board that's not even available to the public, that's not gonna work. You need something automated because you don't have millions of people who have copies of your board. Obviously having cheap evaluation boards that are widely available helps, but even then it, it's still a niche. Most people don't, uh, I'll have them. There's a really cool project called Kernel CI. Kevin's here somewhere, who's the, uh, one of the key guys there. And they build the kernel 1,500 times a day. And they boot it 2,600 times a day on different boards. They've done 3.2 million boots, over 260 boards. Uh, since 2014, and they do catch a lot of problems, actually. So, kernel CI. It builds the kernel a lot of times, and it boots the boards. Uh, there's not much more testing right now, and even that simple just is the board still booting, it's finding a lot of issues. It's, it's quite common that it seems people just break the boot of one of the 260 boards that they have there. Um, kernel CI is done, also I should mention that there's about eight, nine labs now that provide uh, boards to kernel CI. Collabora, Bailib, Free Electron, Kevin has one, Shirt has one at home. There's a, a bunch of people who provide them and they want your support. So if you have boards that are not there, you can provide, um, connect them to the appropriate equipment and make them available to kernel CI and all the details are on the website. Um, so this is what kernel CI does, but kernel CI is only for the upstream kernel. If you're doing a real consumer project, customer project, you're probably not using an upstream kernel. You're probably using something with custom patches, uh, customizations, drivers that are not upstream or will never go upstream because they come from an ARM vendor and everything is terrible. <laughs> so you, you need to do CI testing for yourself with your own board downstream. 
And typically that, that's not done very well. We've heard from, and these are quotes from actual living, breathing customers. Oh, our Jenkins server has been broken for weeks, but we'll fix it in three months in the next phase. Or uh, we have a testing department, right? They'll test when we do a release in three months. Or we do build testing, right? We build it, it builds, it's okay, it's done. Um, uh, that's not enough. So why, why do you do this continuous integration thing? Uh, in many big organizations, it's seen as a box ticking exercise. Someone up there has decided all projects must have continuous integration. And then people doing embedded boards say, huh, all this is, this is from the, the web people, but we're gonna, just gonna have a build server and that's gonna be it. And then we're gonna set it up and then box ticked. We don't have to care about that anymore. And so one of the problems there is that the users, who are actually the developers, don't see the benefit and they don't trust the tests. Setup is seen as an effort, as too much of a barrier, as like a big waste of time that could be done in actually making the, the, pro the project go forward. Uh, on many ARM boards, people think that flashing the board will be a, a, a pain, flashing, deploying, it's a bit of a, sometimes a bit annoying. Uh, just building it sometimes is a challenge. Um, and often people don't even have what I would call the basic infrastructure of testing. Maybe they don't even have a system to build golden images that everyone can use. Uh, there might not be a standardized build environment. Uh, all developers are just meant to you know, download the Yocto tree and build it at their desk. Uh, and then you get, everyone gets a slightly different project. So to make automation easy, you have to start with what I would call the very basics of a half well done uh, embedded project. So that means a consist consistent workflow and a standard standardized way to build images, ideally with only one or two or three simple commands that part are possibly just long shell scripts, but something you say, build an image and then you wait and then you get an image. So this is the key thing. A build infrastructure that's standardized Obviously, if I build it in Fedora 27, and then someone else is building it on like Red Hat Enterprise 3, and then like, oh, it, it, it doesn't, it's not the same compiler, everything is different, and the result will not be the same. So what we recommend is using Docker images. So everyone builds inside exactly the same environment, which means you get the same result. Um, we've had a lot of success, especially like some of the build systems we got from some ARM vendors that I will not name target like a very specific version of a very specific distribution. And if you don't use that, uh, stuff doesn't build. They rely on the tweaks for that GCC version or stuff like that. So that is a huge time saver. Also, you want to all avoid manual tweaks. So I, I've received a document from a very large San Diego based uh, ARM uh, SOC vendor. And it was a, like a 15 page document, how to build an image for our platform. And there was a page where it says, so you open this text file and you replace this string with this string and then you run this command and then you go back to the text file and replace it again. And then you run this command. And I was like, oh, so don't, don't do that, seriously. Uh, so to make a good, uh, a good build, you need to have the whole thing automated, and it's not only good for automated builds, it's, it's also good for, uh, you know, people. Humans save time. So to improve the perceived value of continuous integration, it's really important to have the last step, and that's closing the closed continuous integration loop. Continuous, continuous integration, CI, is not a pipeline. It's not something that starts at one end and ends at the other. It's something that starts with the developer, goes around with lots of computers, and comes back to the developer. It's to tell the developer that there is a problem. If the developer is not told that there is a problem, it will not get fixed. And then you have your dashboard that says red, 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 red for six weeks, and because no one has ever checked the dashboard. So <coughs> this is why we, we, we're really, really, really keen on having notifications, systems on build failures, 
either by email, IRC, Slack, or whatever else people are using to communicate. So it's, it's in your face, you know it, oh, you broke it. Um, even in an organization, maybe you need to have someone who comes and says, hey, you broke it. Um, infrastructure like GitLab, GitHub, Fabricator, etc., they have often a way to trigger continuous integration before the branches are merged. And this is really useful because A, you can block broken branches before they break everyone else's workflow. And it's a really easy way also to, for the developer to submit the branch and have it tested on, on a lot of different use cases. So on a slightly different use case, like the WebKit people, they run tens of thousands of tests that take like half a day on, on the real computer, but, but they do it in a couple of minutes in the cloud. So this kind of things is really useful, especially on like a lava thing. You might have dozens of different boards that need testing. So next, oh yeah, I said lava. Lava is the Linaro automation and validation architecture. It is not a continuous integration system. It's a part of a continuous integration system. It makes testing with boards easier. Uh, it's focused on managing boards. So you can do things like check the health of boards by having like a known good image and then you can boot it and see, oh, if that doesn't boot, then the board is probably broken. So we need to throw away the board and get a new one instead of thinking that all of your new code is broken. It can schedule tests on boards. So you can, once you've created these images, you can boot them on, flash them on the board, boot them, run some scripts and then get the result out. It can control access to the console of the board. It can speak all the different things, SSH, uh, serial consoles and other things. And it can do power control so you can turn on and off the board when you crashed it. Uh, it's really, really easy to install. It's packaged for Debian, so on Debian it's literally an app get installed away. Uh, there's also Docker images, which are like, you know, a Docker runaway. Um, I was saying Lava is not a full testing system. It's only a part of the loop, and it needs to be integrated into uh, something that creates the images and manages it. Um, for example, we use Jenkins because it's easy and it's click, 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 and you get something that works. Um, the whole thing is basically really easy to do. So I'm gonna explain a bit how to set up Lava. Uh, hopefully after this talk, you can set up a Lava thing in a couple hours if, or less. Um, uh, I set up stuff in like two or three hours by asking a couple questions to sure. So it's, 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 it's really easy. Uh, base requirements. You need a way to turn the board on and off. Uh, typically we use a manageable power switch, so just Pull the power, it's off. Uh, you need a way to interact with the bootloader for custom kernels. Uh, Lava supports a bunch of them, but the most popular ones are U-Boot and Fastboot on the Android platforms. And you need a, a way to access a reliable console, probably serial, uh, because that's what U-Boot supports. You might, it can also support things like SSH and things like that once you're, you're up. Lava, for the power off, power on, it, it doesn't care how you do it, as long as you can do it with the, a command line. We use a thing called, called Lava PDU, which is a, a daemon to control power distribution units. So we used a, a bunch of different ones. So in our office, we have one of these really expensive APC ones. Uh, it's big, fits in a rack, um, it works, but it, it, it's not the cheapest thing. Um, you can buy them for a lot cheaper on eBay. There's a bunch of cheaper ones that we've used with success. There's the Energy, Energy Network Power Sockets, the little, little boxes with power sockets on it that are network aware for like 70 euros, so it's pretty cheap. Uh, the Devantec Network Relay Boards, up to 20 relays, 150 euros. And we have even some like, you can get like really cheap USB ones for 20, 30 euros, it's, this really shouldn't be a, a, a blocker. Then you need access to the console. So typically serial, 
Um, what we do is that we have a lava server somewhere and we have a lot of boards all around. So the boards are not connected to the lava server. They're connected to other little servers around uh, in, in different places. So the console has to be over the network. So we use ConServer, there's also Cert2Net and a bunch of these things which are basically just serial to network um, connectors. Bootloaders. So Lava supports a bunch of, uh, of bootloaders. I mentioned U-Boot. This is, I think, every single board we have in our lab is U-Boot based. Um, Fastboot, obviously, and it supports UEFI, IPXC, et cetera. Um, and there's not that hard to add. Um, and bootloader ideally should be configured for network boot to um, make it easy to test things. Uh, Lava device configuration. So I'm going to give a little example on how one can configure a new device for Lava. It's just a couple of slides to show you how easy it is. So this is an example of one that we have in one of our labs, and it's for a rock chip, uh, rock to square board. It's one of these little, really cheap boards. Uh, so you start by having some pretty obvious things that you expect with addresses where to load things, what kind of console devices, in case we stay here, it's a, it's a serial thing. Um, how, how to uh, build, what kind of image, right? It's an ARM, MK image, or U-boot. So basically this is the configuration for a type of device. That's it. Next thing, we want to configure a specific instance of a device. So the first thing is that we extend the the device type that we've just configured, and then we give it a couple commands, like how to get to a console and how to reset it. So we'll be like, you know, um, we, we use the PDU client, the, the Lava PDU thing that, we, that I described earlier, so it's a client server thing. So the, um, the client, it's connected on a server called Fullboss, a certain host name, and a port so it says like this is like port six on our on our power switch. So this is the one that you should reboot for this device. So there's a bit of configuration there, but nothing really complicated. Uh, we have on, off, and reboot just turns it off, wait five seconds, and turns it back on. So this some pretty standard stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And um, next is all right. Now we have a device, but how do we submit a test to it? Uh, the tests are in Lava are defined by YAML files. Uh, they can be submitted directly through the XML RPC API or via our command line tool. There's the official Lava tool, but we've written something called LQA, uh, Lava QA, I think. <laughs> and that we use, it's, it's, a, it's a bit easier to use. It's a simple command line tool. And it's easy to use either for developers who just want to submit one build or for um, integration into our Jenkins. So it's based on the Jinja 2 template system, so it's pretty easy to um, template. So this one's a bit longer, I split it over three slides. Part one, I give the name of the, of the job, right? This, this refers to the name of the previous thing before and uh, some timeouts, visibility public that says the lava, to the Lava UI uh, web thing that, oh, this is public, everyone can see it. We can also have private ones that you can only see through a, uh, if you're logged in. Um, then you have the first action. The first action is to deploy the image. <coughs> so we say, hey, you have two minutes to do that. If it's, this takes one two minutes, you fail. We're distributing through a TFTP server. Uh, this is where you get the, uh, the, the kernel, the rambis, the modules, etc. These are all actually uh, links to the Jenkins, the output of Jenkins, which has done the build already. Then we say that the OS is open embedded, and then Lava as, as knows how to push, push these things to U-boot. Yeah, because next we say, how do you boot? Well, you boot using U-boot. We're going to put this in a RAM disk so we don't take time to flash, so it's a bit faster. 
Um, and we're going to wait for one of these prompts, either linear or test or hash, right, or root prompt. This, that, that tells us that, oh, well, the boot is finished. This is all you need to do to actually boot the, the device with a, a, new, a new image. This is cool. Okay, now we have a test that can boot a device. That, that's already better than nothing, but we can do better. We can actually run actual tests. Um, you can write your own, obviously. There's a bunch of them that are already defined in um, the Linaro QA test definitions thing. They're mostly for normal, uh, what does it say, o operating system functionality. Uh, can you read from the disk? Can you read from the disk at a speed that's acceptable according to whatever you had before? You have regressions in all kinds of uh, device and stuff like that. So it, it's relatively basic kernel test to just make sure that the device is not completely broken by something you did. Obviously, if you're doing an embedded system, often you have a very specific function that you know you will want to perform, so it makes sense to run tests for the, the core functionality of your device. Uh, so let's say it's a video capture device, you want to maybe make sure you can still capture video, things like that. Um, now, I mentioned earlier the CI loop, it has to come back to the developer. So, Lava, you cannot expect the developers to go and look at the dashboard. So, Lava, it's a, it's a web application, it has a nice dashboard, you have oh, thousands of builds, and no one goes and look at it. Um, this is why you want to give back feedback to the developer. Uh, for example, we use GitLab because it's nice to open source and everything. So we can, we trigger it on a, on a merge request and then we can get the feedback back into the merge request so that the person tr who would do the merging would have the feedback that this has passed or not. Um, so this is a loop. As we can see on the left, we have our developer and he does a commit and he pushes it to something, right? GitHub, GitLab, that's, or some other Git thing. And then, Jen, and then that, that tells Jenkins do a build. So Jenkins does his build, and then you get some build artifacts, probably an image, a device tree, a kernel, some things. Then Jenkins, from these build artifacts, submits a Lava job. Then Lava runs, and that produces test results, which are probably some kind of YAML file or something, and then L Lava can send a notification back to the user through email, Slack, IRC, or whichever people are using. That, oh, you broke something. Um, adding notifications in Lava is really easy. This is a new thing of Lava 2, so if you're using Lava, upgrade to Lava 2. Um, so we had this basically at the end of the thing, where we had like boot, deploy, test, and you just add notify in the end. And then you can have a criteria, let's say this is finished. You give it the URL. As you see, this is a templated URL because the URL will change on every execution. And that we send a JSON, et cetera. And, and next we have a little bit of uh, Jenkins script that you can copy paste because that's what I do. Um, so we create something called a, a webhook which is a Jenkins extension that just creates a URL that the result can be posted to. And it, it tells that information through uh, Lava, through the LQA thing, the little thing we wrote. And the, then it waits for the web to complete, writes it, the JSON to a file, and there's a little Python script that should wrote to convert the JSON to JUnit style XML, so it shows up nicely in Jenkins. So that's basically it. Um, if it's really, really, really important to do continuous integration, if you're not doing a desktop, even if you are, really. Uh, if it's not tested, it doesn't work. Uh, if it's not automatically tested, it won't work automatically. <laughs> um, and it requires a bit of work, but once you've done it, it will save you so much time, it, it's not even close. 
I mean, every project when, where, where I say, hey, this is a small project, we don't need continuous integration, uh, so it's only a short project, every time it comes and bites us later. And once you have continuous integration, then it's writing more tests. Writing tests, very important. Don't forget that. Uh, it's a very, sh it's not a big investment. So setting up Lava and Jenkins from nothing on bare servers, it, it's a day or two of work. Uh, setting up a new board, it, it's most of the time is in making sure the board boots and stuff. Oh uh, yeah, I forgot something. Oh, no, that was my earlier slides. Some boards you need a little button to turn them to make them to flash them. Don't do that. <laughs> Seriously, don't do that. It's very annoying. Then you need to short the board or something, and it it, it gets. Uh, 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 into a little soldering project, which I mean, some people like, but it, it's a bit annoying. Uh, if you want to do that and you're lost, feel free to ask us. By us, I mean Shirt. Uh, he's on IRC all the time. And especially if you want to do it with the kernel CI people upstream, kernel, just talk to the kernel CI guys. Kevin's there. He will love your boards. Thank you. Um, I have to ask, do you, have you ever heard of K-Test? No. Yeah, I know the name, but I haven't played with it. Uh, it actually does a lot of the similar things. It's in the kernel. If you go to tools, testing, K-Test, it's a Perl script that you could set up. To, it automatically will build, boot, install, run tests. It's a framework for running tests. That's uh, in the kernel. It's um, been there for a while. It's, uh, maybe it's not specific for this. But it looks like it could probably either be worked together or something. Probably, yeah. Lava's kind of big thing is that it supports a lot of boards. So you can have uh, one build and then ship it to like, you know, 30 different boards. Right. Well, I'm saying is look, maybe look together instead of having, or if there's a way to interact. Yep. Anyone else? I should also mention that all of this is not only for kernel. When you're in an embedded system, you have a lot of user space code. You know, it has to work together. Uh, does it also make easy to perform some manual testing? Because uh, in your example, uh, the testing is performed after the commit. But uh, in my experience, it tends to end up with a lot of update, update, or fix, fix, fix commits, which are quite dirty. And uh, sometimes when you are debugging or bisecting or something, you, uh, you are just manually repeating uh, the same operations all the time. And in fact, we often end up with the scripts or even not just commands in a text file that you copy paste on your bootloader or whatever. And having a, a tool for this um, makes it easier. I, I think that your, uh, your solution could possibly help here, but I don't know if it's as easy to use manually. Uh, as it is to, uh, to use in an automated way. So uh, the LQA thing that I showed in the gen, that, that actually was designed to be run by developers. Mm -hmm. So you can literally don't do in one command, boot it on my board. Okay. That might not be on my desk, right? The board that's somewhere else. Because often I, it's a project that works on many boards and I have only one or two on my desk, but we have 25 in somewhere else. So for this kind of thing, yes, it can be done. Okay. But also, a lot of the good practices is just making it easy to build images that you can flash. Um, you've said that there is a PDU support to switch on or switch off the board. Is it possible to track the power consumption? to detect, for example, that uh, the new build has increased the power average of a target? I, I don't think the PDU daemon thing does that, but no, that, that's is, a very is, good idea. Does it do it? Is, is it um, in the PDU or in other support uh, something to, to detect uh, the, uh, a change in power consumption of the board or of the target? To be honest, I have no idea. <laughs> Kevin might know. Come up, come up. <laughs> so, 
So the, the short answer is it depends on the PDU, of course, if the PDU can actually measure the power or not. But in, in our lab, we have some devices that are hooked up to PDUs that can actually measure power. And so you, there are lava jobs that basically tell when to start measuring the power, like whether you want it at the boot or whether you want it when the test actually starts. So you, if you have the functionality in your PDU, you can actually automate it in the, in the lava job as well. Um, is it possible for the flashing part? You explained that you can do it with U-Boot to have a more custom way of flashing a board. For example, if you have uh, some things that should use a script, uh, download image, or um, a custom script to flash or anything. Yes, the, the U-Boot support is actually just a, there's a template with a lot of commands and you can r write your own template for anything custom. So this one, there's already a bunch of them, but it's pretty easy to just replace the commands. If you look at what the U-Boot does one, it, one does, it's it just, just a list of U-Boot commands written with templates where it replaces uh, uh, like the image name and stuff with the one that you set. So it's pretty easy to create a custom one. Kevin says for the recorded audience, if you can script it, then Lava can do it. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say, if you can script it, a computer can do it. But. Um, do, you, do you know if uh, Lava has been used to measure uh, power usage of the board or the computer during the test? Yes, I, I think this is what Kevin just said. I think the answer is yes. I guess, is it, I think it's hooked all to kernel CI for some boards, yeah. yeah. There's some public example. And if you want to play with a Lava instance, at least there's a lava.collabora.co.uk, which has a bunch of public where, uh, that are hooked to kernel CI, where it's basically, you can see the kind of output that we get from public builds. There's hundreds of builds every day there. We have dozens of boards attached to it in two labs. All right, I guess, any more questions? Last chance, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to throw a board.